Welcome everyone and uh, assalamu alaikum. Good evening. We'll just give you uh, everyone a few minutes uh, to join us as we begin our conversation. This is Dr. Hatem Bazian, uh, UC Berkeley, Islamophobia's uh, uh, research and documentation project. And we've been having these conversations uh, with guests, uh, individuals that we have had relationship with, uh, worked with, as well as topics that we needed to delve into. We started this back in May as the shelter in place took place. Uh, we needed to find uh, a way for us to continue to have these rich and enriching conversation. And today, I really, uh, it's a conversation that I wanted to have for some time. Uh, our dear colleague uh, in Japan, uh, Dr. Sal Takahashi, uh, who's a human rights uh, scholar, uh, teaches in, uh, in the field of human rights, peace and peace study, and also has had considerable uh, work and engagement with the Muslim world, including for myself, an engagement as well in Palestine. And uh, to really to think of how from Japan, how the how do they view the Muslim world? And what are the issues that uh, we see are dealt with <coughs> both at the university level, but also broadly in the Japanese uh, society. So Sal, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum, welcome. And uh, really just give us maybe a short biography of who you are, uh, your background, and then we could delve into some of the immediate topics if you can. Right, sure. Um, yes, no, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's really wonderful to see you, and, uh, and I hope I can be of use. Uh, um, I'm a human rights lawyer and a human rights advocate. I started my career in human rights um, working with refugees here in Japan at Amnesty International, the office in Tokyo. Uh, then I went on to uh, the UK and I, I, I got my master's at, uh, at Essex University, the Human Rights Center there. Um, and uh, I, work, I worked for Amnesty International in their international secretariat, so the international headquarters in London. Um, after that, I moved on to the UN. I did various different postings, the last of which was uh, deputy head of office in occupied Palestine of the UN Human Rights Agency. So <clears throat> I did that from 2000, early 2009, right after CAST led, to, uh, through May 2014, so just before um, defensive edge. Mm. Funny, as funny as it might be, I was sort of sandwiched in between those major military offensives uh, mm. against Gaza. Um, but that was a five-year uh, tour of Palestine, if you like, and of the human rights issues in Palestine. Very, very eye-opening and, of course, very, very life-changing in many different ways. Um, the UN Human Rights Agency had an office in Palestine, in Ramallah, Mm. Um, and also in Gaza, uh, they, it was set up in right after Oslo. So the idea of the office was to provide technical support to the PA uh, in you know, strengthening their human rights legislation and all, all that human rights practices and all that kind of stuff. Now, unlike most human rights offices of the UN and mm. anywhere, <laughs> um, the office in Palestine did not have what we call a monitoring mandate. So what that means is, um, they were supposed to give assistance to the PA, but they were, they did not have the mandate to document and report on human rights violations. So clearly, what, does that, what, the, what is the impact of not having the mandate? Well, any human rights office in the UN or anywhere, you know, would have this monitoring mandate. Well, what we do in human rights, what we do is, uh, you know, we speak with victims, we speak with witnesses, we document violations, we analyze um, you know, what legal standards are applicable and what are, what's being violated, and we try to campaign for uh, you know, a just remedy for mm. these rights violations. That's what we do. And you know, a lot of people think that human rights is about you know, sort of holding hands and being nice to each other and hugging trees and all that kind of thing, and that's not the case. You know, human rights is really about accountability and combating impunity. That's one of the, you know, that's the major platform of, of human rights. So, um, you know, to do this, 
this monitoring mandate, what we call the monitoring mandate, basically documenting and reporting publicly on human rights violations. This is the core of any human rights operation. You're not doing this, you know, I mean, I hate to say this, you're not really doing human rights. Mm. And the fact that that was not included in the mandate of the office in Oslo already says something. You know, basically, okay, this office is not going to talk about bad things that Israel does or even what the PA does. It's just going to, you know, make make sure that the PA are nice little boys and girls that continue to you know, talk with Israel. So that was really the, the crux of the thing. Now, uh, fast forward to 2000, late 2008 and Operation Cast Lead, major league uh, military offensive by Israel on Gaza, uh, major oppression of, you know, demonstrations and everything throughout the West Bank, even more than usual, of course. And so what happened was the Human Rights Council of the UN, which is made of member states, got together and they insisted that a monitoring mandate be added on to the mandate of the Office of the Human Rights Agency. So that's right around when they hired me and basically my main, uh, one of my main roles was to set up that monitoring operation. So basically that meant, you know, driving around uh, throughout the West Bank, also Gaza, because we have, of course, we have an office there. And, you know, really meeting with NGOs, meeting with victims, overseeing the documentation of all these kind of violations and everything. So, you know, it was a, it was a very life-changing experience. And I, I really got a, a pretty good insight, if I dare say so myself, as what's going on. Um, so anyway, so that was until 2014, uh, May. Um, I could have stayed with the UN if I wanted, but I, I decided it was time to time to leave and, and time to come back home. So I, I left that. I came back to Tokyo. I was working uh, in business and human rights and doing a lot of teaching on the side. And from 2019, I've been uh, teaching full time as professor of human rights and uh, peace studies at Osaka Jogakuin, which is a it's a small uh, women's university in Osaka. It's, it's still quite rare. I mean, we do mm. have women's universities in Japan, but they're slowly, the more and more they're, they're shutting down mainly because we, there's less demand. But um, we have the, our university has, uh, has a pretty good program of teaching content in English. So basically teaching human rights and peace studies in English. So we have a very strong English education component, but also it's not just teaching English. It's not just you know teaching how to you know give directions in English or that kind of thing. It's also teaching human rights. We have a it's one of our pillars, human rights. Uh, we, and, talk, uh, we were talking yeah. earlier about uh, you were teaching courses on human rights and peace and so on, and you were teaching about certain aspects of the Muslim world, and especially Palestine. And you spoke about how does it how is teaching these subjects in a Japanese university versus let's say your experiences and interaction with your colleagues, including myself, outside of Japan. Yes, sure. Well, I mean, we have, um, I've said I'm very fortunate because I do have a lot of freedom to teach about Palestine and to give students uh, a good picture of what's actually happening in Palestine and not the kind of things that they read in uh, the you know the, the so-called international media like uh, you know cnn or bbc uh or uh, the japanese media which is not as bad in all fairness as a lot of the international media but it still can be quite uh biased and slanted so i have a lot of freedom i have a lot of leeway to give them uh, the real picture and i have to say i'm very grateful for that like i was like we were talking about uh, just before Hatem, I, mean, I honestly don't know how you survive in a place like the United States where there is such, you know, I, as, as I understand, there is such, such pressure um, not to be vocal on issues of Palestinian rights. Um, you know, the, I, 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 I speak a lot about Palestine. I mean, I, I do, you know, I'm very involved in the BDS movement here in Tokyo or here in Japan. And I do speaking towards, you know, all this kind of stuff. I do this all the time. And um, what I, I always, I, I, I call the, the ABC words that mm. we had to be very careful of, like when we were in the UN, um, A being apartheid, um, and certainly C being uh, colonized, uh, you know, all these kind of colonialism, you know, all these kind of words that we always had to be, we had to avoid at, at all costs. Mm. Um, but in Japan, it's, it's, you know, we have more freedom to do that. There isn't that kind of pressure. 
um, yet. But you know, let's see. I mean, uh, uh, we we also face the kind. But of the same political kind of... landscape in Japan is also has been shifting to the right, which is something also people aren't aware that the political landscape, even with uh, Abe's resignation, people became aware that he's actually on to the right wing part of the political discourse. And maybe you could uh, at least delve a little bit into Japanese political landscape. And then as it relates to uh, Palestine, but also other parts of the Arab and Muslim world. Yes, sure. Yeah, like you say, I mean, Japan has been, sh Japan has been shifting very dramatically to the right uh, for quite a while. But uh, in particular, since 2012, uh, uh, which is when Abe came into power, um, that there has been a, a pretty dramatic shift to the right in all sorts of different ways. I mean, you know, security related uh, legislation that, excuse me, that violates human rights, um, selling weapons abroad, uh, making it easier for Japan to send its military abroad. And that's, uh, you know, that's, of course, a very, very worrying, uh, worrying shift. I could go on for 90 minutes about this, but I don't think you want that. I mean, I think the real, what's, what's most relevant in, in, in many ways is the right in Japan is, you know, I mean, I make fun of them because they're not even, they're not even proper nationalists, you know. I mean, they do talk about Japanese values and protecting, you know, our culture when it comes to issues of human rights, because, of course, we're not like, you know, the Europeans or the Americans. We are more group focused and we don't want to, you know, oh, human rights, that's too individualistic. Yeah, there is that element of the narrative. But in fact, the, the right is just basically pro-American. When it comes to foreign policy, there's no question of you know, Japan forging an independent route, an independent foreign policy. No, I mean, it, it's remilitarization and, and securitization as part of the alliance with the Americans. So what the right has been pushing for, for years, and, and you know, Abe is, is very open about this, and his cronies are very open about this, basically um, making it easier for the military to be sent abroad on military escapades with the United States, presumably in the mm -hmm. Middle East. Um, the, uh, you know, our military has already been doing military exercises together with the Marines in sort of desert-like locations. Uh, I've heard reports of it taking place in those sort of model villages you know, modeled after Arab villages or South or West Asian villages, you know, all these kind of things. So <clears throat> that's been part of it. That's always been part of it. And, um, you know, that's definitely a worrying trend. Now, Abe's left, but uh, all the indications are is that he's going to install his, really his, his right-hand crony in the top job. And, um, I guess he's going to try and he's going to be trying to pull the strings from uh, from behind where it's safer. So you know it, it's uh, I, I I don't have such a positive outlook as to where things are going to go in the short term. But um, you know, in that you, regard, uh, yeah, do you see the uh, is there a change in uh, Japanese Japanese foreign policy, in particular relative to the Gulf, uh, and how did they view the recent uh, reapprochement between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, uh, both from the economic sphere, because there seems to be some interest in there, but more broadly as a diplomatic engagement. Where, do, where does the Japanese government, as well sure, as maybe sure. some of the uh, leading political intellectual figures stand on that question? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, throughout, <clears throat> ever since the oil crisis, like in the 1970s, Japan's uh, adopted a, a vaguely, I don't know if I'd call it pro-Palestinian, but not an overtly pro-Israel stance on the whole Palestinian issue and you know, issues in West Asia in general. Now that hasn't, it hasn't shifted, it hasn't changed dramatically in all fairness, but definitely there's been a noticeable shift um, in voting in the UN on, uh, at the Human Rights Council on issues in Palestine it's still not, they don't vote with the Americans or the Israelis. <clears throat> They're still abstaining on most cases, like most of the Europeans. But, you know, they've, if you look at some of the statements they've been making about um, the International Criminal Court and uh, efforts to uh, combat impunity, they're just not on with that kind of thing. But 
more than that, it's, it's, there definitely has been a move towards strengthening relations with Israel. That's been very, very clear over the past few years. Um, then that you know, also is linked in what I mentioned before about, uh, about selling weapons, joint development of weapons. Um, there have been reports of, of uh, projects to develop drones and to buy Israeli drones. And just uh, and on, you know on the on the on the so-called defense part, there's that, and also just ties between Japanese businesses and Israeli businesses. I mentioned before that I used to work in the field of business and human rights. I was working for uh, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, which is a an international NGO based in London, and I was a Japan representative. And I used to get it was actually quite. It was quite uh, interesting because I used to get calls uh, informally from big companies, I mean, you know, household name companies, and they would say, look, Saul, you know, we're, we're kind of in a gen. You know, we have the government really strong arming us into doing deals with Israeli companies. At the same time, we're a bit concerned about the reputational risk because we understand that there are issues. We don't really understand them, but, you know, we know that there's a lot of, there are a lot of issues about this. So maybe, Saul, you could help us out by directing us to a clean Israeli company mm. where, you know, that we could have business with that is not involved in the settlement enterprise, the colonization enterprise. And, you know, I would have to say, well, sorry, man, there isn't any. So, you know, that, that was, you know, I had to disappoint them. But, you know, th that was just a, another indication of, of the pressure that the government is putting on businesses to do deals with the Israelis. And Abe, I just saw the other day after he, after he announced his resignation, he's been calling all the, you know, all the prime ministers, all the presidents of the world, and he spoke with Netanyahu and, and um, you know, expressed his appreciation at the fact that there had been increased Japanese investment, increased more Japanese deals with Israeli companies and all that kind of thing. Most of that information is not yet in the public realm, so we have to, you know, we have to do some digging to see what's really going on. But that's the situation, and, and you know, a lot, I wouldn't say a lot, but quite a bit, you know, it has to do with what happens in the U.S. in, in November, mm. because I, I, you know, I am concerned. It's not like I'm a, I'm a fan of the Democratic Party, but, uh, you know, given the sort of overt uh, positions of, 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 of Trump and his, and his faction, uh, you know, I am concerned that they basically, the, the Americans would come to Japan and say, look, you have to, you know, you have to vote with us at the Human Rights Council, you have to, you have to buy weapons from these. You have to move your embassy to Jerusalem, or we're not going to, you know, we're not going to play with you anymore. And with and, the relationship right now between Israel and United Arab Emirates, would that make more economic incentives for Japanese companies to come in? What would be the effect of this uh, Karen deal, and then also possibility of Saudi Arabia? which is a major trade partner for Japan. Uh, sure, many sure. of the projects that uh, Japan has in the Gulf, really Saudi Arabia is a major hub. Yes, sure, sure. Well, you know, like you say, I think a lot of people are looking at this whole issue from a point of view of, of, of general ignorance. I'm talking about the general public. And, you know, they are fooled by words such as peace deal and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And they see it really as, as another economic opportunity, another opportunity for businesses to make money. And certainly the way that it's been portrayed in the, um, we, have a, we have a newspaper, you know, the business related press. I mean, certainly that's how it's been portrayed. I have to say, in all fairness, in the other, uh, the other media, the other mainstream media outlets, it's, it's uh, it's been a little bit better, in, from my point of view, in the sense that uh, it has been, uh, it's been, it hasn't been overtly positive. It's uh, most of the editorials have said that look, this is not going to bring about peace in any way, shape, or form, and there has to be a just solution uh, to the Palestinian issue. Otherwise, you know, this really isn't going to go anywhere. So, while not 100% perfect, I mean, there are things which I think should be more included, but. In general, it's more. Uh, there's more recognition of the of Palestine and what's going on, and how this whole thing with the UAE is not 100% uh, positive in that regard. But um, you know, it's. I think a lot of, and I, I think it's probably not unique to Japan. But I, of course, a lot of people 
in in Japan, I would say, in the general public in Japan. I see this a lot with my students, and of course, you know, when I give talks and that kind of thing, you know, they really uh, don't know about the Palestine, uh, you know, about the colonization of Palestine, about what's going on. They have uh, this general notion that it is a religious uh, conflict, and because uh, the vast majority of Japanese are not Christian or Muslim, you know, they don't, you know, or they don't, or, and certainly not Jewish, you know, they, they just, it, it, at, at that point, they just think, oh, you know, we, this is too complicated. We don't understand. It's not something that we could really get into. It's a religious conflict. It's intractable. Oh, these poor people. But there's also, uh, you know, so there's a lot of false equivalents in people's minds. And there's a lot of, for sure, there's a lot of uh, there, there, there's a lot, there's definitely an attitude that, uh, you know, Muslims are terrorists, Muslims don't want to live in peace. There is a kind of Islamophobic attitude, not as uh, in your face as it is in a lot of Western countries, for sure. But there is this kind of attitude, and uh, certainly the government has been making sure that that attitude is, 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 is more and more uh, entrenched in the general public. Uh, maybe we could shift a little bit right now to speak around the uh, maybe Japan's neighborhood. So you have uh, close to Malaysia is there. Mm -hmm. You have major uh, Muslim population as well as in China, the Uyghur. We spoke a little bit about the Muslim population in New Zealand with the Christchurch massacre. How is the Japanese, uh, at least from your view, Japanese mm -hmm. relationship with the Muslim world in that arena, or if you think of Pakistan or India in that, in that sense. Is there something distinct, something different, unique in terms of the engagement? Also, uh, Japanese role, let's say, in addressing the genocide in Myanmar. Uh, and was there well, any involvement, especially in the human rights, peace uh, uh, aspect of the Japanese engagement? Well, I mean, with regards to Myanmar, actually, there has been Japanese involvement, and it has been, you know, utterly uh, abominable. Uh, the, uh, the government has, has taken a very pro-Myanmar stance from the outset. Um, it is kind of funny because, uh, honestly speaking, I'm not exactly sure where that comes from. I've spoken with uh, diplomat friends who are, you know, they, they, they're, they're just career diplomats, and they have to toe the line that their political masters give them. But um, they, you know, they, they also say they, they don't understand it because it's, um, you know, I thought it would be mainly, it's certainly not an Islamophobic thing. And, and I thought it was mainly because big business wants to exploit the resources. But my friends say, well, you know, I think it's just more than that. It's some kind of weird, just pro-Burmese thing, which seems to exist in the psyche of many of the psyche of many of the Japanese ruling class. And I think that's, you know, with the history and everything that's possible. But getting back to sort of uh, relations with other predominantly Muslim countries, I mean, that's, there's a, I think there's a distinction in the mind of most people, and that goes up right to the political ruling class, between Muslims in South Asia and West Asia uh, and uh, Muslim countries here in Southeast Asia. So like when we look at Malaysia, Indonesia, they're softer people. They're people whom we colonized in World mm. War II. You know, we're, we're stronger than them. We're better than them. Um, they're... Uh, you know, we're more advanced than them economically, socially. We, uh, you know, we can, they're obedient. We tell them what to do. I think there's that, certainly that kind of underlying attitude. And when it comes to Islam in those countries, there's a, an, a general idea that, yeah, that's a little bit different because, you know, with the Arabs and people in South Asia, you know, they're these extremists. They're they're fundamentalists, they're kind of religious wackos. Mm. But in Southeast Asia, you know, they're a little bit closer to us. They're not, you know, we don't take religion seriously and they don't either. And, you know, you can go to Malaysia and you can have a beer, it's not a big problem. And, you know, there, there's that, I think there is that kind of distinction in the minds of most people. Um, the interesting thing is, is in Japan's a country that has, I think, sort of two, um, two contradictory trends, if you like, mm. uh, in society right now when it comes to, comes to Muslims and how they look, how they, how, how they see Muslims. Um, you know, I mentioned before that the government definitely has uh, tried to promote this narrative that Muslims are terrorists, extremists, 
not so much that all Muslims are terrorists. Of course, they don't say that openly, and most governments would wouldn't. But you know, the constant. If you look at their, like for example, the papers and statements on terrorism, terrorist organizations are really synonymous with mm. you know, Islamist organizations or fundamentalist organizations. So there's that. Um, you know, there, there's there's that perpetuation of that kind of narrative for sure. And like I, you know, like as you know, I mean, there was there was and probably still is blanket surveillance of all foreign uh, foreign nationals that they believe are Muslims in Japan by the police. At least there was for a certain time. We 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 know that for a fact. Um, and you know, the media also tends to echo that official narrative because the media in Japan is is uh, only in theory free, let's put it that way. And they operate, certainly the mainstream media operates in a very constrained environment where they really have to toe the government line. Um, tabloids are certainly no better. I mean, tabloids, as you can imagine, they have, they, they come out even more openly with very sort of extreme statements about Muslims being terrorists and all that. And they're also, you know, we have our share of political commentators, uh, you know, Islamophobia industry people. I mean, not so much in Japan, but they are definitely connected with the Islamophobia industry in the United States and Europe. But um, so there's that sort of official sort of trend. But um, when it comes to the general populace, definitely people are, are influenced for sure. And, and there are, you know, there have been limited opinion surveys um, showing that people uh, are wary of Muslims, they think Muslims should not be allowed in Japan or they shouldn't be allowed to live that kind of thing. But at the same time, there's also um, a, a what's, what's been termed recently in recent years as the halal boom. Mm. And there's no official data for this really, but it, it is plainly obvious. I mean, you go out to restaurants in the city center or around tourist sites and, you know, businesses really, I mean, with COVID-19, everything's, you know, sort of in the toilet now, but, you know, they have been really sort of just, just stumbling over themselves to uh, show uh, tourists that they have uh, Muslim-friendly wares. And, and, you know, even, you know, like, like box lunches sold in tourist locations, I've seen halal certificates and big letters, you know, we are halal and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, there's, there's that, but uh, where do you going. get, you know, where is the reasons coming? Do you think is it as people were uh, beginning to be less going to the West for tourism attractions so on and uh, as restrictions on travel in Europe, in the United States, that there is a Muslim orientation toward Japan as a tourist destination or also preparation for the Olympics, which is something that we're going to talk about a little bit sure. for how that preparation might also impacted this? Well, I think it's more the latter. I mean, the government has been, you know, promoting Japan as a tourist destination incessantly for, for years because, you know, with our economic situation being you know, so terrible, um, they see it as a way of, 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 of getting money. Um, as Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, the middle class uh, starts getting more and more disposable income, Thailand as well, you know, all, all, all those sort of neighboring countries that we have around us, there's just, there's been much, much more tourism. It's not just Muslim countries, but, uh, you know, just much more tourism. But, you know, people have cottoned on that, you know, a lot of these tourists believe this funny religion, which we don't really understand, but it means that like they won't eat certain stuff. And if they come to our restaurants and we try to serve them and they won't eat them, well, we're in trouble. And we want them to feel, you know, to feel happy. We want them to, to like their experience in Japan. So, you know, restaurants, hotels, I understand. I mean, if you, uh, if you sort of register and you know, when you're reserving your, your booking your room on, on their website, I guess you give your nationality. I've heard that if you type in your Malaysian or Indonesian, then they already have a Holy Quran and a, and a prayer rug in your room. I've you know, read this about some hotels. So, you know, there's that kind of thing. Now, of course, this is, um, it's because they, you know, it's still based on the idea of the good foreigner i.e. somebody who comes for a short time, they drop a lot of money and then they leave because, you know, they don't try to stay permanently or do things like complain. So, you know, there's that kind of element and, it's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a hundred percent ideal, but it's still, uh, I would argue, still, it's a positive trend. I mean, it's a, it's, 
more sort of understanding of, of, of the Muslim world and of Muslim principles. So it's not a bad thing. And, um, you know, you have this uh, th with uh, the discourse clearly shifting towards discourse and government policy shifting towards greater uh, acceptance of foreign labor. And this is really something dramatic for Japan because it's something that Japan has not done ever in, in modern history is let in unskilled foreign labor um, in any kind of sort of formal, uh, formal way. Um, so, you know, as it's, there's been a clear shift in that direction. And so people, you know, there is really a lot of talk about coexistence, it's not a word I really like, but it's, you know, this coexistence and how can we get along with foreign, look, foreigners are going to be here. They're going to he be here for at least five years. And let's face it, probably a lot of them are, are going to end up staying. So and where are the majority of these uh, foreign workers are recruited from? Oh, it, it, how the, the, we have a new system from to, from uh, not this past April, but the April before. And uh, under the new system now, uh, unskilled foreign laborers can apply for a visa to come to Japan and work for uh, five years. Now, of course, there's always been foreign labor in Japan. Of course, there are people who've come in on tourist visas and they've just stayed. But we've had a, a, we've had a system called the technical internships where people from participating countries come and they work as interns and they are abused as slaves and you know treated horrendously mm -hmm. but they leave after two or three years so what do we care now the idea behind this new system seems to be that the people who did internships but want to stay in japan will apply for this visa so that they can stay for an extra five years. That seems to be the thinking behind it. Now, this system so far has been a flop because the applicants have been embarrassingly few and it's just, it's just nothing's happening. But you know, the point is it, it's shifting towards and the participating countries tend to be, well, China, Vietnam, but Indonesia is a participating country and there are a lot of technical interns from Indonesia who uh, are here in Japan and they've been working uh, really sort of menial labor kind of jobs. And, um, you know, there's, they have uh, brought, uh, you know, their, their snapshots of what Islam is and what uh, Muslims need to do to, to, to live here. So, you know, that's also been part of, but I think it's more, um, it's not just focused only on Indonesia and Bangladesh as well, but also just uh, just a general recognition that foreigners are already living amongst us. We have plenty of Pakistanis, plenty of Iranians, a lot of Indians who are Muslim, um, and there are also Japanese Muslims as well. And there's just a general, I think, recognition that look, these you know these people are here. They're going to be more of them coming. They're going to be part of our community. So how can we make sure that um, you know, again, that we coexist peacefully, that, you know, we have respect for them, they have respect for us, and that we basically get along. Again, it's not a perfect, you know, I, 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 hesitate, I, I don't really like this word coexistence and this kind of thing, but, you know, it's, it's not a negative trend, let's put it that way. And it's not, um, so far, it's not um, the kind of open and overt, even violent xenophobia towards that mm. population it's not been so prevalent. It hasn't been such a big deal here yet. Last time we spoke about the emergence of mosques in Japan, because uh, again, uh, Japan is a homogeneous population, uh, historically no experience with Islam. So as you get new, uh, uh, whether it's technical workers or unskilled laborers, uh, you're actually developing into some uh, mosque institutions and the visible presence of Islam. So can you speak about what are you seeing and what sure, are the sure. challenges that are there at this time? Sure. Um, and again, this is one of those sort of contra is part of that contradictory trend because um, definitely there are more, you know, the, the Muslim population in Japan is increasing. That's, that's very clear. There's no official data about this, but the best guesses are 200,000 people or so. Um, which in a country of 120 million is not a huge amount, but um, definitely there it's increasing. And that's uh, partially 90%, an estimated 90% of that are people uh, who, are, who are foreign nationals or 
maybe foreign nationals who came and who have naturalized as Japanese, which is, of course, entirely possible, especially if you marry a Japanese, you know, you, you get a Japanese passport, this is how it works. But 10% of that are also, you know, that means about 10% are ethnic Japanese, like me. So, you know, that's, uh, and that number is definitely increasing. Um, there are mosques uh, in, I think last I heard, we have 47 prefectures and I think it was, I think that it was over 30, maybe it was 37, late 30s, you know, 35 to 39, something like that. So there are masjids in pretty much every prefecture in Japan. Some of them are just, you know, flat, a room in a flat, uh, but uh, others are purpose-built mosques with minarets and everything. Um, certainly the one in Tokyo is, is very visible. Uh, the biggest one, which I think they're still create, I think I think it's ready yet now in Nagoya. It's a, a purpose built masjid with minarets and everything. You 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 know you're driving and apparently you see it from quite mm. afar. So you know th that's that's happening. That's taking place. And um, more and more, I think you know Islam remains obscure to most Japanese. It remains something foreign and something weird and something strange. Let's face it. I think for most Japanese, that's how it is. And in the surveillance case, which I mentioned before, what was really funny was that the police were, were completely concentrated on foreign Muslims. And Muslims, you know, Islam equaled foreigners. And it, there was no sort of suggestion that they were actually surveying Japanese Muslims. Um, I mean, and I know, you know, a different department does do that occasionally, I mean, they, mm. they come to see me, but, you know, the, the point is, it, it's like, it was not part of this big operation. And I honestly believe that there was, you know, to most of the police, the detectives involved in this, they, they just, like it, like, it never occurred to them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we, Muslims, yeah, of course they're, of course they're foreigners. What are you talking about? And I think a lot of them is just like never occurred to them. But that again, that's also you know changing a little bit. I mean, there are cases of, um, you know, pretty prominent, prominent. I mean, you know, like university professors. And then there was uh, a few years ago, there was a a a a woman who had passed the bar exam and qualified to be a solicitor, a lawyer, and she's the first openly Muslim woman or man, uh, Japanese, to do that. And she wears a hijab. And, you know, she was interviewed in the newspapers. And, and you know, so this, th there are these kind of people who have been appearing more and more in the media. Now, most Japanese probably look at these people, they think, they, they think they're kind of weird and kind of strange. But um, that, you know, just the mere fact that they're appearing in the media and the mere fact that there's more recognition, I think, amongst the general populace that, hey, actually, you know, Japanese, there are some Japanese Muslims. Wow, gee, this is something I never thought of. You know, it's not a, it's, it's not a bad thing. And so, you know, that kind of thing is, is definitely going. I mean, towards your question about masjids, um, what uh, the opinion surveys that I mentioned before were actually taken in areas, they, they went out of their way to take those opinion surveys in areas where they were building masjids. Mm. Um, not necessarily purpose-built ones, but but that, you know, they were building masjids and of course the community would, you know, tell the local community leaders, look, we are building this and we're here, we're moving here and, you know, this is what it involves and, you know, we want to live peacefully and we don't, we're not breaking any laws, we're not terrorists, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, people, what I think, but the as the research that I've read on this kind of thing is that initially the local community, the ethnic Japanese community are are very wary and they're against and they're like, oh my God, you know, these are terrorists, what's gonna happen? And, you know, or, or they're, they're, there's gonna be traffic jams, you know, all this kind of, all these kind of wariness. But um, the experiences that as the, as the Muslim community, you know, speaks with the local community, shows them what they're about, shows them their plans, and as they, you know, sort, out any kind of differences that there might have been, um, you know, that they, 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 they quite quickly move to acceptance. So that's, uh, you know, that's really what the story is. Um, you know, again, Japan is not uh, a, a, a physically openly violent society. So, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of um, overt in your face uh, Islamophobia, you know, attack, physical attacks, 
it, it, it's it's quite rare in Japan, and and not just because they're Muslims. I mean, just like any kind of minority, it's actually pretty rare. So that's something. It does happen. I've seen. Uh, I I I'm aware of a few cases, not physical violence, but um, it's like death threats, threatening letters. Uh, to, to Massachusetts, you know, I know of a few. So of course it does happen. And, um, you know, it does happen. But it's, so far, I would say that it's, 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 it's going in a direction which is not, uh, which is not that bad. If we could talk maybe a little bit about uh, the particular uh, Islamic practices in Japan, what type of Islamic practices and influence? Is it an influence of uh, let's say Saudi Arabia, the Gulf, influence from Malaysia, from Pakistan, India, uh, what type of traditions, religious traditions that are practiced within the Japanese Muslim community? Sure. Um, I think uh, the Saudi influence is still quite, uh, quite small. Uh, the Gulf influence, uh, the impression certainly that I have is, is that it's still quite small. I mean, let's see what happens. Um, the main masjid in uh, Tokyo, is actually uh, was built by um, refugees from Central Asia mm. in the 20s, and they came over as uh, you know after the communist uh, after the communist government was set up. You know there was Japan was on the white Russian side, so you had this community of refugees. They came over, and they basically you know they they built the masjid, and and now it's uh, it's run partially I think by the Turkish government. It's it, doubles as a Turkish cultural center. I'm not really exactly sure exactly how it works, but uh, there's, you know, that's, that's the community. There have also been, you know, it's very diverse, uh, for sure. Um, there are, uh, there's a significant community of Iranians that uh, came to Japan, mainly in the 80s up to the early 90s, mm -hmm. when you know, our economy was booming. We had a no visa agreement with Iran. So people came, yeah, I'm here as a tourist, wink, wink. And they just stayed. Uh, some of them, you know, many of them left, but some of them married Japanese or whatever, you know, they, some of them just the state. And so there's, you know, there's also not so much an Iranian government influence, but there's a, there is an Iranian community. There's a Kurdish community um, of refugees, unfortunately not recognized as refugees yet, but that's a whole other issue with uh, Japanese human rights policy. But, um, you know, there's a community of a few thousand that is, uh, they live close to each other in a suburb of Tokyo. And, uh, you know, they have, in, the, the suburb is called Warabi, but um, uh, it's uh, referred to uh, in, the so in social media and a lot of the media as Warabistan. Mm -hmm. uh, not in a good way. So, you know, that's a kind of, uh, that's a very sort of discriminate, it's looked at in a, in, in a somewhat discriminatory way by a lot of people. But, um, you know, there's that too. So, but you have, it's very, very diverse. And if you go to like the main masjid in Tokyo, if you go uh, Friday prayers, then really it is a very, it's a very international bunch, you see. And uh, the, the hotba is, is, is recited in Japanese, English, and Turkish. It's very long. You're sitting there and... Mm legs get sort of uncomfortable but it's uh it, so it is very diverse and um and that's i think very interesting a lot of south asians you know pakistanis bangladeshis indians uh indian muslims like i mentioned you know there are a lot of a lot of all sorts of communities in japan and despite the discourse which you mentioned of japan being a homogeneous society you know, it's repeated over and over and over in public discourse and government always Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, and people are waking up to the fact that there are a lot of different communities of, you know, a lot of different people here. And, uh, you know, we have to figure out what that means for, um, you know, for Japan as a country. Uh, if people have questions, you could uh, uh, write your questions on the chat, and I'll make sure to, to ask uh, Dr. Sal as we continue the conversation. Uh, Thinking about some of your students, are they writing thesis research? What kind of research they do in relation to the Muslim world? Uh, what sparks their interest uh, in uh, the various classes that you're teaching? Well, I'm very happy to say that I've had a few students who have decided to write on Palestine. So that's uh, something I'm, I'm very proud of. <laughs> you know, I mean, of course, you teach, you teach full time, too. So as you know, I mean, if we get through to a few students, that really makes our day. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy. I'm very happy that uh, a couple of them, uh, not a huge amount, but certainly a few of them have 
um, have expressed interest in Palestine, and I, a few of them seem to even have traveled there too, actually, which is which is great. I think that's a great thing. Um, the uh, uh, we have again, there's there's a very strong human rights and peace component in our in our university. So um, a lot of the students are interested in refugee issues, and some of them have. Uh, started talking about refugees in Japan. One of them is writing on, on Kurdish refugees in Japan, and she's uh, been in touch with uh, organizations, and I think she might actually be speaking to some of the refugees. So, you know, that's also a really good thing uh, as well. I definitely do want to expand uh, the horizons of the students, which is what, we, what we're here to do, of course. And uh, yes, uh, I mean, I, let's, let's see if I can expand them to more issues sort of broadly with other Muslim countries as well. But uh, certainly the, the fact that they've been interested in Palestine is very happy. I'm very happy about that. I know that there's been considerable Japanese engagement with uh, various refugee communities and groupings. Uh, has there been any engagement with the Syrian refugees in particular? both on a research level, but also as far as engagement in human rights, advocacy. Have you seen anything uh, in Japan toward that end? Well, there are, yeah, I mean, of course, there are NGOs uh, that work on humanitarian issues in West Asia. And, and you know, they're, they're, you get, like, if you go to fair NGO fairs or university fairs, of course, you know, they have their stalls and they talk about the situation of Syrian refugees in various different countries. So there's that kind of engagement. And I think, uh, you know, Japan is a big, big donor to the, to the UN Refugee Agency. It's a big, big donor to UNRWA and to uh, Palestine in general as well. So, you know, there's that. But um, as far as allowing refugees to come to Japan, resettling refugees, or recognizing refugees that come to our shores and, you know, ask for protection. The record of the Japanese record is really abominable. I mean, it really is awful. I don't know that that's, yeah, and it's not just because of, just because they're Syrians. I mean, you know, we're, we're awful towards all refugees. I mean, you know, the Japanese government's policies towards refugees are, have really been awful. And um, what is the reason and what's the uh, what's the limitation from a human rights critique what's what's the limitation in there you know well i mean first on a, on a technical level of course the ref the policies the ref the system that the government has set in place to you know determine whether somebody is a refugee or not is you know these policies are overly restrictive they are arbitrary, they are secretive, lacking in transparency, and just generally geared towards making sure people are not recognized as refugees. So, you know, in the technical sense, I'm a human rights lawyer, so I could go on at great lengths about what's wrong with those. Um, why this is the case? You know, this is, this is the million dollar question. Uh, I mean, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think one could say, yes, you know, with this whole discourse of us being a homogeneous society, there's a lot of suspicion towards foreigners and, you know, we, we don't want uh, foreigners coming and staying and perhaps being a burden on the public purse. And, you know, there are all these kind of, uh, you, we, we could speculate and talk about those kind of things. It's really, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, being a lawyer, you know, I guess I don't have the tools to really look at how cultural factors play into that, but it's, you know, what's, what's very, very clear is that our, you know, our refugee policies are really garbage. And, and um, refugee, the thing is, refugees are under international law, as you know, they're a separate category than other mm -hmm. migrants, right? I mean, economic, economic migrants or any other kind of migrants, governments have basically a carte blanche to, you know, decide whether they are allowed in or not, you know, as a, this is the first thing you learn as a refugee lawyer, you, you, you never have the right to enter a foreign country, never. And that's why the EU is such a big deal, because it's, it is, it is, you know, as close to that as you can find in, in, in the modern day. But um, the, uh, you know, refugees are a separate category. Refugees are people who didn't want to move, but they had to move. They were forced to move, forced mm. to migrate. So, you know, they are, they're a special category and governments have, countries have the obligation to provide them with protection. Now, the division, as we all know, in the real world is not quite that simple. But um, what's, 
you know, what's been going on in Japan over the past de few decades is we have the lowest birth rate in of all of the OECD. We, you know, our mm -hmm. birth rate is pathetic. And um, our population is shrinking. I mean, we are the first quote unquote advanced country to really witness our population. It has been shrinking for, for the past few years. And there's been this huge uh, angst and, and public sort of discourse about what to do about this. And as this gets back to a little bit to what we were talking about, about uh, you know, Muslim migrants, but um, you know, a lot of commentators have looked at, look, why don't we bring in migrants? Why don't we bring in migrant laborers that'll replace, you know, replace the pop, replace, you know, the, the population that we've been losing, and then you know, this is what it takes. This is what we've got to do. So um, there's been this long debate about this, and um, I, I've always felt that a lot of refugee advocates have witnessed that, have looked at that, and thought that this is a bandwagon that they can jump on. Mm. Right. So they jump on this and say, yeah, look, we have to, you know, our population is shrinking, you know, our welfare system is going bankrupt. So we need foreigners and we need and a lot of these refugees. Well, look, they can work and, you know, they want to work. They're skilled and blah, blah, blah. And I've always felt this is a very dangerous trend because, mm. you know, refugees, it's utilitarian in nature. Yes, it's exactly. Thank you. It's a utilitarian view of, of refugee protection, which I've always felt is very, very dangerous. And now. You know, now, okay, we're back to talking about letting in migrants. But for a while, a number of years, this whole discourse has just sort of died out because people realized, look, 100,000 migrants every year for, you know, 20 years. This is just, in the Japanese context, this is just not realistic. And even supposing that we had so many migrants that want to come to Japan, which frankly is not the case. So it's, uh, you know, this, this sort of died out. Now we're back to oh, talking about letting in migrants and all that kind of thing. So maybe there'll be something to it. But the whole sort of acceptance of refugees remains very, very dismal. And it's definitely affected by political factors. There's no question. Up till this day, I think there has not been even one Chinese uh, Chinese national who's been recognized as a refugee. I heard maybe there was one in a few years ago, but you know we have Uyghur refugees in Japan. Um, mm. uh, they have, but they're just they, they haven't been recognized as refugees. You know, some of them have tried to seek asylum. Others have, you know, tried to sort of extend their stay as students and that kind of thing. And I think the government, in many cases, have been sort of reasonably sort of flexible with that kind of thing. But the fact of the matter is, they require international protection as refugees, and that's just not forthcoming. So, you know, that this has to be done. But this is a whole other question, I think, which which has to be sorted. Yeah, I, I'm teaching a course this semester on refugees, immigration, oh, right. Middle East, and decolonial decolonization. And one is to understand there are different categories immigrant, migrants, refugee, asylum seeker, inter uh, internally displaced person, yes, uh, yes. internationally protected person, uh, uh, stateless person. So all these are different categories. And in people's mind, they just only think of one thing. This is a foreigner. Uh, yeah. And when the context was in the United States and Europe and Japan and other countries, including Muslim countries, that they have increasingly have become far, far more restrictive across all categories with the exception of uh, workers that are needed for the internal economy. You know? Again, my critique on the Gulf states and my critique in advanced economies that as long as you are able to pick the uh, produce, clean the streets, work in the restaurants, clean the hotel rooms, you are welcome. But if you're a human being that needing help because of your human rights needs, uh, then you are actually not included in that category altogether. Yeah, no, exactly. That's that. You, you, exactly. I completely agree with you. And, um, you know, and what we what we must never forget is the responsibility of, uh, you know, the, the quote unquote advanced countries in creating the situations that forced most of these people to flee. And, uh, you know, Japan always sort of sits back and say, ah, yeah, but, you know, we're, you know, we're not like the Europeans. We never colonized West Asia. And, you know, we don't do these kind of bad things. So somehow that lets us off the hook in some way, which is complete nonsense. I mean, we, you know, we sell weapons to the Americans. 
uh, Sony US is a big, big uh, contractor for the Ministry of Defense or the Department of Defense in the US. Um, all of our, all of the fancy computerized stuff, you know, they've ended up in rockets that have landed in Gaza. They are no question, you know, all over Yemen, Syria, all of this kind of thing. So the notion that we aren't responsible directly you know, above and beyond the fact that as a member of the international community, we're responsible full stop. But, you know, the whole idea that we don't have anything to do with it. And, oh, what are these brown skinned people that are all of a sudden coming to our borders? You know, we had nothing to do with this is complete. You know, it just it, it completely misses uh, the point and just isn't true. You know? mm. uh, our colleague uh, Sadiq Sheikh from the Othering and Belonging Institute at Berkeley says, in your opinion, is it safe, is it safe to say that the rise of Islamophobia in Japan relates directly to the rise of xenophobia and anti-refugee sentiments? Um, I think all of these things are, of course, related. I mean, it's, it's you know, when, people, when you have these xenophobia, xenophobic <laughs> groups that are against, you know, letting in refugees or against the ethnic Korean population here in Japan, um, and you have, you know, Islamophobic sort of narratives and the whole thing. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's impossible to really disconnect these from each other. I mean, it, it's part and parcel of the whole process, part and parcel of the whole, you know, othering of people who don't look like us, who don't, you know, worship the same God or who don't speak the same language or who are just culturally different, um, who, who don't, you can believe this, who don't take out the garbage properly. I know this sounds very ridiculous, but it is one of the things you hear about over and over and over in Japan. What are the trouble? What, what, you know, why, what, what, how would you feel? You have this, like you have this in the press. How would you feel if a foreigner, you know, if there were many more foreigners living in your neighborhood? Oh, well, you know, they don't know how to take the garbage properly. They don't know how to divide the recycling. You know, all this, this is ridiculous. But it's just, you know, it, it's part and parcel of the whole process of, make, uh, of looking at people who are somehow different uh, and outside of our political community, outside of our community that we can exclude just because, just because, you know, they're, they're not like us. And so it's, yeah, of course, I think it's all connected for sure. And if you look at, you know, if you look at like some of the publications of the extreme right in Japan, and I, I do this, I mean, I'm not trying to do it with a full stomach, but it's, you know, I do this because I have to do it for my research. And, you know, a lot of these narratives that they advance, uh, be, they become very mainstream, but the whole, you know, it, it's all just mixed together. You know, mm. Muslim terrorists, refugees, uh, Koreans, who are also terrorists because they're connected with North Korea. Um, you know, welfare cheats, Japanese welfare cheats. You know, it's all meshed together. And they have the, you know, they use these, uh, they, it's like they're cards that they hold in their hand that they just sort of keep on dishing out, uh, you know, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of whether it makes sense. So it, it really is, it's all connected, I think, for sure. You can't, you can't separate them. We talked earlier, we began to talk about the uh, preparation for the Olympics. And I remember we talked about the mobile mosques that were being prepared. <laughs> yes. uh, if you could just touch on, on that and uh, where they are at and what happened. I know that the Olympics have been delayed, but that was an interesting discussion about also the Japanese thinking about all those that are going to come and uh, participate and partake in the Olympics, both as audience as well as uh, athletes. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, the, the mobile mosques, and I guess they, I don't think there's any real discussion about them. I guess they just, they just went ahead and, and did them. <laughs> I guess they sort of made them. I certainly haven't seen any. I think the idea was that they would only be there for the Olympics. But, uh, you know, it, it's sort of connected with what I mentioned before about the halal boom. You know, these are good foreigners. They're coming, um, they're going to spend money, and then they're going to leave. And so we want to make sure that their stay with us is enjoyable and that they, you know, that they go back to their countries and have, you know, and say, that, well, we, I had a wonderful time in Japan. You should also visit and you should also drop money. So, you know, again, it, it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's related to this whole concept of the good foreigner versus the bad foreigner. And I have a little bit of issues with that, but as you know, those mobile mosques that were reported on, I think in Al Jazeera and some of the other outlets, you know, it's not a bad thing. 
it's it's not a bad thing but the whole olympics you know there were despite some positive aspects of of human rights policies that were adopted by some of the companies and that kind of thing i mean in general you know it's a pretty negative it's there have been a lot of negative ramifications um, in terms of security based uh legislation that the government has rammed through um uh, legislation which you know again allows for much more surveillance of the populace um, that you know the government just openly said well we can't hold the Olympics if we don't pass this law the international community will not allow it and it's complete nonsense it's just, you know all the and I can tell you as an international lawyer it's just not true but uh, you know they use this uh, this lie basically to ram through this kind of legislation what was kind of um, maybe not so surprising, but what was, uh, what was very notable is that all the media outlets and everything who, when it came to light that the police were surveilling Muslims in a blanket way, just because they were Muslims, you know, the media were, they were not critical of this at all. They were like, yeah, well, sure. Yeah, of course they're terrorist risks. So that's what the police, that's what the police is here to, to do. And then the, the government rams through this bill saying that, well, you know what, we're actually going to give ourselves the power to do this kind of mass surveillance of Japanese as well. Now, all of a sudden, the mass media is like up in arms about it. And some of the left of center outlets were revisiting the Muslim uh, surveillance case and saying, oh, you know, you know, is this really what we want and all this kind of thing. It's like, well, it's a bit too late for that now, man. You know, this is uh, first they came for the Jews, like, uh, you know, that old poem. So um, that kind of thing. Uh, also with the Olympics, you know, again, that is also asked, uh, that's, a, that's also been a precursor for contracts with Israeli security companies, more cooperation with Israeli companies in general. So, you know, in that regard, there, there have been a lot of negative ramifications from the human rights viewpoint. And a lot of people are against it. I mean, a lot of, certainly the left of center people are, are, are totally against the Olympics. You know, it's not some kind of unified front that the whole country is, you know, waving flags for the Olympics. It's not. And I certainly hope the whole thing is canceled. And they, you know, somebody gives us our money back because, mm. you know, the public funds that have been wasted for all of this has just, it's just been ridiculous. Well, the consequences of uh, public expenditure on sports and sports outlay has been a disaster moving from one country to the other. Yes. Uh, yeah. Every country that sponsors, uh, and host the World Cup gets uh, stuck with a bell that lasts generations, yeah. same with the Olympics and so on. Uh, and I'm not surprised that this would be the case uh, in relations with, to Japan. Maybe we could come back to the last part uh, that we started with, uh, that you worked on Palestine uh, directly, you were there on the ground. So as a observer from Japan right now, that continues to work with the human rights, uh, where do you see things going, both on the human rights and the, and just comment on the current circumstances, and uh, both from the Palestinian Authority, where they are at in terms of human rights and uh, political discourse, uh, Israel in general, and where do you see the situation evolving? Well, you know, it, 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 it certainly pains me to see, uh, you know, the terrible things that are happening. I mean, in terms of human rights on the ground, of course. And also, you know, the recent UAE agreement. Um, also, this hasn't been reported on as prominently, but Serbia and Kosovo is all, have also, apparently they've apparently agreed to move, uh, well, Serbia has an embassy in Tel Aviv, they've agreed to move it to Jerusalem. Um, Kosovo didn't have relations with Israel, it was actually Israel that was the one that didn't want to have relations with Kosovo, so presenting this as an Israeli victory is a bit dodgy. But anyway, so they're gonna have relations and they've also apparently talking about uh, having a, an embassy in Jerusalem as well. It's interesting, I, I understand about the Serbs at least, is that, um, they made a promise that they would move the embassy uh, to Jerusalem, but in a year's time or so. So obviously they're waiting to see what happens with Trump. And if they manage to get in the EU, well, that's another excuse not to do it, right? So let's see. But in general, I mean, the whole, you know, the, mem the momentum, of course, is, 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 clearly, is clearly problematic from my point of view. It's very bad. And, you know, um, Palestine is, is important 
to me because I was there and because it's Palestine and it's important to all human rights people, it should be, because it's, you know, it's a horrendous human rights issue. But it also goes, you know, beyond that. I mean, and, and that's what I think, you know, some commentators have been saying this, but a lot of people just don't seem to understand that this is really fundamental uh, to the whole international order. You know, if, if countries get away, a small number of countries can get away with just you know, flouting, the, flouting the rules and, and saying, you know, we don't care, and, you know, thumbing their noses at international law and international justice, then, you know, the whole system is really heading towards collapse. You know, it's, and, and that's, you know, that's where it's so important that Israel and also the United States is the key enabler. But certainly Israel has to be held accountable for what's been going on. And that's why, you know, that's one of the main reasons in my mind why the UAE doing what it did is, is, is so disappointing. Um, what's going to happen in Palestine, you know, I mean, million dollar question, of course. Um, a lot of, a lot of you know, commentators and, and, and scholars, you know, when we get together and talk about what's going to happen or what do we think should happen, two states, one state, you know, the whole thing. Um, I, I've sort of tried to avoid getting involved in that, um, mainly because I, I feel, and you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this, but you know, I, I feel because I'm not Palestinian, it's just not for me to say. I don't think I should be coming to somebody's country and saying, oh, well, you should agree to a two state and hold the border here, or you should agree to a one state and live in peace. It's not my business. Not, not so it's not my business, but it's just, it's, I don't have the right to say that, I think. But um, one thing I do believe is, um, you know, clearly the momentum is moving towards some form of one state. You know, I think a lot of people talk about the one, you know, a lot of people have been advocating for the ODS, the one democratic state or the one state solution. And, you know, okay, fine. But um, as a human rights lawyer, what I, I, I feel really must never be overlooked is the need for ensuring justice for all the violations that have taken place up till now. What we can't have is a situation where we have one state and it's like, okay, let's let bygones be bygones. Now you guys are just gonna live in peace. Now your neighbors, sort it out. This, in my mind, just can't be. I mean, it has, you know, there has to be serious uh, way to ensure that past violators are punished. It has to be, you know, whether it's, what, how exactly that is going to be formed and what exactly that means, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, I'd like to contribute to, to, the, to the debate on, but it's something which is really, you know, vital to all of this, because we can't just let, obviously we can't just, you know, let anything happen to the Palestinian people, but also because it's, it's really fundamental to the whole, you know, whole system of international law and justice that we have. It can't be that we revert to the might makes right era. And that's what, you know, Trump has been pushing overtly with his apartheid plan and with all of this kind of stuff. I mean, it's, you know, he, he thumbs his nose at the whole international system and the ramifications of that could be really immense and uh, really severe. A lot depends on what happens over there in November, I think. Uh, Muhammad uh, has a question. He said in the chat, right. uh, Malaysian ex-Prime Minister uh, Mahathir uh, was keen on the so-called look east policy, uh, more inclined toward Japanese experience to emulate and learning. Is this, is this vision being followed through by Malaysia and maybe other uh, East Asian countries or uh, is it something that really did not succeed in relations to Malaysia? Well, I mean, Japan has very good relations with Malaysia, for sure. And I think, um, you know, Japan being the Asian country that in economically, at least, and institutionally has been very, uh, you know, has gone quite far. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's not surprising, you know, there are a lot of Southeast Asian and East Asian countries that, 
look at some aspects of Japan as a model to follow in building institutions, for example. And Japan does, you know, Japan contributes a lot of uh, resources to um, setting up laws and, and setting up these kind of institutions in a lot of Asian countries. So that, you know, that does take place. But um, what's happening now, I think, is more the Chinese influence. You know, China is really um, strengthening uh, its influence in leaps and bounds. Uh, not just in East and Southeast Asia, but really all over the world. Um, I'm not, I don't necessarily think that's a negative thing, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a fact, it's a fact of the world that we live in now. And what that means for international relations and certainly what that means for human rights is something that uh, you know, we need to see. You know, we, you, you mentioned the Uyghurs uh, and uh, you know, last summer, there were a group of predominantly Western countries that wrote a letter criticizing China uh, quite vehemently. It was sent to the president of the UN Human Rights Council and uh, you know, very critical of China and what they're doing on the Uyghurs and demanding that the Human Rights Council take serious action. And then just a few days later, the Chinese managed to run around and get an even bigger group of countries to write a counter letter saying, you know, um, you know, what China is doing is fantastic and they're cutting down, you know, they're combating terrorism and all this kind of nonsense, complete Chinese narrative stuff. And what, what was really extremely disappointing was that, you know, the major Muslim countries were part of that counter letter, mm. right? So um, Malaysia was not, uh, that I remember. And I don't think Turkey was either. I'm talking at the top of my head, I can't remember. But a lot of, uh, certainly the Gulf countries, Egypt, you know, they've signed on to this counter letter. Um, basically, you know, throwing the Uyghurs under the bus. And that's, uh, you know, that really is abominable. And that's, you know, that's bad. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of, because the Chinese, uh, because the Chinese government attitude towards universal human rights is questionable to say the least in general, you know, a lot of the, I understand a lot of the influence and a lot of the resources they've been using in a lot of these countries they've been, you know, basically acting as a counterforce against universal human rights. Now, I'm not, you know, I don't want to idealize what <laughs> the place of the Americans and the Europeans in all of this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's a huge amount of hypocrisy to go around. But I do want to say, that there, you know, there was a facade. And, you know, when you build a facade, it does mean something because it takes upon a, a, a momentum of its own in a way. And, you know, countries, you know, there was this kind of idea, notion that these were international norms of human rights that had to be followed. And if you didn't follow them, you, should, you had to at least sort of pretend you did. Yeah. And you had to justify why you didn't. But, you know, with, uh, as China gets more and more influential, you know, there's certainly a, a possibility that, that those kind of norms and that kind of facade might really be um, right, really be chipped away at it. And with Trump, of course, it's just even worse. Well, that's the challenge in the period moving ahead. Uh, even the whole discourse of human rights, the primary violators of human rights have been uh, the countries that are the permanent uh, countries yeah. in the, in the yeah. Security Council of the United Nations. And yes. the United States, Russia, UK, France, and also China has been major violators. Uh, so one has to navigate uh, how to discuss and critique the rise of China while simultaneously not to fall into the threat of the rising tide of the Southern Hemisphere that is undermining who is gonna change the topography of power. Because yes. you're gonna, there are some at least arguable, if you think that the West has been oppressive, wait till China, it will show you a different level of oppression. And it seems this argument is uh, feeds into an existing line yeah, exactly. of the yellow pearl and so on. So how to critique China, rightly so, on their human rights, while simultaneously say, well, the United States, you really, you can't even begin to talk about human rights uh, yes. with Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan, current selling of weapons to every oppressive government around the world. Uh, and then you could add to other countries. So what we need is really a new regime of international human rights that could take the major players into accountability uh, while uh, taking into consideration a large 
a considerable number of racist discourse that is there lurking. Yeah, no, exactly, definitely. And, and this whole sort of, you know, the whole sort of neo-colonialism uh, that was very prevalent in the League of Nations, you really do see it in, in the way that the UN operates in a lot of different ways, even sort of on the ground as well. And we have to see, you know, we have, whether the UN as an international institution, is it really fit to serve the purpose? You mentioned the Security Council. You know, nobody in their right mind thinks that the Security Council is a great institution. Um, you know, the only, the only people who think the Security Council is great as it is are the permanent fund. You know, the other, you know, it, clearly this is, you know, this is how the world looked like in 1945. It's not how it looks like now. And, uh, you know, so, but every, uh, every effort uh, that's been made to try to sort of revise it and change it has obviously proven unsuccessful because all of the P5 have to be on board. So, you know, all of these things are really going to come to play. And, um, you know, we, we just have to see, we have to see where it goes. But what's important, like you mentioned, is, is you know, the need for sticking to the human rights uh, discourse or, you know, building on the human rights discourse while at the same time making sure that we don't fall into the kind of discriminatory sort of attitudes and mindsets that, sometimes you know are the undercurrent of them very tough well we'll take a last question from cj jackson i think this is chris from my class if i'm correct he says does international law truly hold the power to hold violators accountable and end these violations when violators foot the bill which basically is saying <laughs> if they're paying the u.n salaries of these human rights monitors uh, can they really be taken into account so are they paying to kill uh, in this sense, <laughs> which that's what boils down. So if I'm paying for it, you should let me have the right to kill. Yeah, indeed. Well, you know, I mean, by having worked in the UN for a long time, of course, you know, you see this in a very, really already at the grassroots level. And of course, at the policy level, the influence of money, you know, money talks, bullshit walks, we all know that. And, um, you know, a lot of people you hear quite often about the, the, uh, the dues, uh, the contributions that countries have to make to the UN and the UN, the US doesn't pay them or the US is late paying them and all this kind of thing. But that's actually a very small part of what the budget of the UN is. Most of the UN in particular, when we're talking about human rights or humanitarian stuff, um, humanitarian emergencies, refugee flows, that kind of thing, natural disasters, those are really predominantly funded by voluntary contributions, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, the UN goes around with a tin can and asks the rich countries to please, con you know, fund these operations. And what happens is, you know, the rich countries, of course, they, that gives them disproportionate influence. And I, I, I know <laughs> as a fact that, you know, they make, uh, demands regarding policies or how operations should run, whom we should hire, you know, that kind of thing. It, it happens all the time. And, and, you know, nobody can claim that it doesn't. So, you know, the way that the whole financial system or the money works in the UN is also, you know, it, it's, it's also a problem. But international law, you know, um, you like, I think this is really what you're asking, is international law really fit to the purpose of this? And the answer is, no, of course it isn't, because there's no global police force. I hesitate to use that word because it's always you know, an American term, but um, there's no global police force. There's no enforcement of international norms to speak. The Security Council is the only body that can really order countries to do things, you know, by legally speaking, you know, in the current international system, you know, you have treaty obligations, you have an obligation to abide by the judgment of international courts. But if you just sort of thumb your nose and say, we're not going to do it, then no, you know, there's little any other country can do. 90% of the time, international, you know, countries do abide by international law. And, you know, they, they take it seriously and they do, you know, they do do it. But when you have a persistent violator like Israel that is backed by, uh, one of the P5, the most powerful country on earth, the United States, then you, you see this. They do whatever they want and they get away with it. Or, or it's also the United States has complete shield. It's actually 
uh, challenging the International Criminal Court. They would not <laughs> respond to it. They withdrew from the uh, uh, Human Rights Committee in the United Nations. So can really international law takes the U.S. to account in this sense? Is it enforceable? And I'm just posing that question. Yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. This is the big, it's the paradox of international law, if you like, in the sense that because there's no real serious enforcement mechanism, you know, how effective is it? Can you really call it law? I mean, some people even sort of pose that question. I, mean, I don't go that far because, like I said, most countries do take it seriously and they look at legal obligations as legal obligations. But when push comes to shove and you have these powerful countries like the United States just thumbing their nose at the whole system and saying, we're, we're just going to do what we want. There is nothing that can be done. That's, that's the problem. Um, now, you know, again, I don't want to make it, I don't want to sound too cynical. I mean, maybe because I'm an international lawyer, but I, I don't want to sound too cynical because, you know, again, we get back to Palestine and we say, you know, <laughs> you know I was, I was, I was cynical as, as, as anybody about what Israel gets away with. We, you know, we know that, but the wheels of, international justice, um, you know, they, they can spin. I mean, I would, you know, Tipsy Livni had to cancel a trip to London because she might have been arrested as she got off the plane. This was 2011 or 2012. I, I can't remember exactly when it was, but, you know, that's how big a deal it is. It, it, it can work. It can take place, but um, it has to have the powerful countries behind it. And that's why, you know, it is so important that countries like the United States and, and others are on board. But, um, you know, let's, let's see. I mean, let's, let, let's see what happens with that and how international law is going to change. I really fear, I think if, if Trump wins another, you know, another term, and, and that's, that's a big possibility, it's a big possibility. But I fear, I fear that uh, they will move towards uh, leaving the UN. Uh, that's really what I what I think might happen, and uh, you know the whole sort of international system could revert to a, again a might makes right scenario, much more overt and open than it is now. You know, like I said, now at least there's a facade. Now most countries at least realize the importance of at least pretending that they abide by international standards. But if we go back to the law of the jungle, you know the ramifications really could be. It, it, they, they'll be felt all over the world. And that's something that really worries. Well, uh, last question. This is from Omar through Facebook. He says, how do you define human rights in a post neoliberal world order without accountability to the rule of international law? So it seems that we shifted from the view of the Muslim world to yeah. a discussion international law. And I really would love next time, maybe we could have a conversation, sure, sure, or, sure. you know, an inter on international law. Where is it going? Uh, the International Criminal Court, because Palestine has a case at the International <laughs> Criminal Court. I wrote a, a Mikas brief for it as well. So we could discuss right, this. So maybe if you want to take this question, uh, you could do that and then we could conclude. I mean, one of the things about international law and, and I guess human rights in general is, um, you know, I'm a human rights lawyer. I've spent my entire career, dedicated my entire career to this. So, you know, I, I do think it's important and I think it's something which, which uh, you know, can't be sneered at. You know, you, you can make a difference in the lives of people. But international, at least human rights is not about it won't bring about a revolution. It won't bring about systemic change because that's not what it's for. That's not what law really does. You know, a lot of, a lot of lawyers, you know, in human rights, we, people spend ages and ages, hours and hours talking about how we can avoid being seen as being political. You know, we have to stick to the letter of the law. We have to be impartial. We have to be, you know, we have to make everybody understand that we are not being political. You know, there's some kind of distinction between the law and the politics. And I remember my boss at the time, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pile, she was a South African judge before she became High Commissioner. You know, she made this speech when she came, she came to visit us in Palestine and said, you know, we do law, we don't do politics. And that's, uh, you know, that's this big sort of, uh, you know, uh, paradigm in international law and international human rights in particular. But it's not really true 
because law is made by political actors. It's not made by you and me, and it's not, you know, it's not set in stone in the sense of, you know, carved out in stone given to, uh, you know, given on a mountain. It's, it's made by political actors and they make it, you know, with their political interests in mind. Now, sometimes once the law is created, we lawyers and advocates, we can use it in ways which the people in power hadn't realized or hadn't thought of. We can use it to, you know, hold them to account. And so it, it, that works. And in, in the occasions where that works, that's, it's great. It's still a good tool, but it's not geared towards fundamental systemic change. It's just not. And, um, you know, like we, we, we couldn't, some people have, you know, try, but we, you know, it, it would be very difficult to sort of build the human rights case against the neoliberal, you know, economic system as such. That's just not how the law is, is formulated or made. So, in that regard, you know, I am a human rights lawyer. I think human rights is important and we gotta, you know, we have to keep it, we have to take it seriously and we have to use it, but it's just a tool. It, it's, a, it's just one tool and it won't bring about, just screaming human rights will not on its own bring about fundamental political change. You know, really that's the kind of thing that you learn very quickly in Palestine, for sure. Human rights are important, but without a political solution, without political change, there will be, you know, all this talk about human rights, it's not gonna, it won't, you know, it won't really do anything. It'll, you might improve the lives of a few individuals here and there, and that's important. That's not the way, it's not a complete waste, but it's not gonna, you know, overturn the system, it won't. So, you know, that's why politics are important. You know, politics, lawyers like, you know, a lot of human rights lawyers look at politics and, you know, they say it's a very, it's a bad word, politics, right? It's, it's something which we want to avoid being seen as having anything to do with. But, you know, political change is brought about through politics. That's how we do it. So there's nothing wrong with it. And that's, that's what we really need to look at, I think. That's one of the things that lawyers aren't necessarily all that good at sometimes. Well, thank you, Sal, and uh, for this really enriching and wide scope conversation covering from Palestine to China to Malaysia to international law. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you with us and definitely we'll schedule another conversation just to deal yeah. with international law and the development in there. Wish you and everybody in Japan the best. Uh, take care of yourself. I know you're just going to be started teaching again. Uh, yes. And uh, hopefully we'll continue communication. I will keep you uh, updated on the April conference if it uh, right, takes right. place. And right. definitely we look forward to see you in person in the future. So thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>